our industry is heavily overweighted towards higher end skills and not as labor rich as for example like a bangladeshi or a vietnamese economy is so i think the coming together of all of these allied to a very vibrant startup ecosystem and in india the startup ecosystem punches well above its weight yeah. what really happens is like each direct job that's created in the startup ecosystem it also helps create three roughly three jobs or so in the overall wider ecosystem right uh, so someone in the finance space for example or someone in the admin space someone in the creative space right so uh, directly indirectly startups have now been responsible for roughly 3.5 million jobs white collar jobs which which have been created right Hello everyone welcome to another edition of the startup operator podcast uh, today we have a couple of really special guests our first guests in the brand new studio that we have Sajid and Amal from Bloom Ventures hey Sajid hey Amal how are you guys doing all good thanks for having us Roshan hi Roshan thanks for having us thanks so much for coming down super excited to host you uh, as i said you guys are the first guests uh, in the studio it's a bit of a work in progress but i guess you know we'll make do with that that's a pretty cool setup thanks so much thanks so much today we're going to talk about the indus valley report for those of you who haven't heard it uh, i don't know if you're living under a rock but uh, it's gone super viral on social media everyone's talking about it there have been memes after memes uh, on people reading the report and it's very very comprehensive it covers the indian silicon valley or the indus valley basically and talks about all of the trends and the structure and so on right related to startups we're going to delve deeper on some of those aspects it's a fairly comprehensive report 120 plus slides so first off thank you so much for putting that together i think it's a great service to everyone in the indian startup ecosystem hey thanks roshan yeah the report did go massively viral the memes were a bonus so amal and i have been slaving at it for the last i'd say one and a half months when we kind of go into this hibernation our wives and uh, amal's girlfriend uh, just give up on us so uh, it feels very gratifying that it's gone viral and thank you for having us here it means a lot yeah awesome so i've been really looking forward to this so i guess you know the first question i have is in terms of how did the remote report come about you know and what was that process of putting this together amal Sure. So I'll just like go back to last year when we published the first version of this report. So this is this report that comes out, which is called the Mary Meeker report, uh, which talks about the trends that are seen in like internet economy, right? And uh, it's been coming out for many years now. It was a very interesting report, but broadly it covers more of the U.S. market and like more from a from a global angle, but like very less about India, right? And uh, the idea was to try and produce something like that for India last year. That's where we began. Going from that, I think when we really started out. and thought of just like compiling various data points and all we realized that like india is like massively starved of ground level data right uh, so much so that we thought that just like putting up a report which was comprised majorly of data points was going to be a very tough task from there the idea kept evolving a little bit and then we eventually reached a state where we thought that like hey like we have some data but then let's like talk more about narratives which is coming out from that data and let's like split it across various things that we were seeing right Uh, so one of it was just talking about india right or just like introducing india to the whole world one area that we focused was introducing indus valley as we call it which is our moniker for uh, the indian startup ecosystem and then also just like talking about how indus valley was in the year 2021 right that's how it originated and that report essentially the first effort right so it involved a lot of breadth but when it came to this year we couldn't introduce india again right of course we also couldn't introduce indus valley again all that's been done so what you were forced to do was to go into the depths of like what all we could cover this time around and hence this year's like report structure which talks about one not just like introducing india but like going into the depths of the macro economic structures right or what are we seeing as for example like in terms of developments in india that that are arising which affects in this valley then another bit was how indus valley has been in the year 2022 right and the third aspect which was like very 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 interesting for us was just like trying to visualize how indus valley is like india's soft power right where like we're seeing that the indus valley has effects which far outweigh just like its current size in terms of the indian economic context right so that's how the report really came about i think as i just said roughly one and a half two months of intense work that's gone into it went and like did a lot of reports talked to a lot of people gained a lot of perspective not just inside the firm but like also outside the firm and i think the 125 study that you see is is a culmination of all that fantastic and you know this year i feel startups have become mainstream right you guys make the point 
point as well where you talk about whether the IPL sponsorships or the Shark Tank or even the very colloquial use of uh, the the term startups itself. And you know, for me personally, having been in the ecosystem for the last fifteen years, it's it's been a big change. <laughs> when we started out, uh, in, you know, back in two thousand eight, uh, two thousand nine, nobody kind of recognized startups, right? I mean, you had to justify it to your um, landlords, your uh, future uh, father-in-laws, and right. <laughs> and whatnot, right? <laughs> Whereas, I mean, today everyone has a recall of that, right? Interestingly, uh, Amal, you talk about this India one, two, and three, and here again, you reference Irina Vittal as well, right? Where she says that you have to. See India in perspective through these various different Indias or Bharats, right? right. And that is the first step to really understanding uh, India and really building and solving for India, right? Um, so, can you talk about that uh, in a little bit of detail? Sure. So, I think this whole classification originally, I think, suggests brain child. I think just to understand how the whole consumer ecosystem works in India it was really beneficial for us, and also sort of like it helped us break down various problems that were being solved. If we visualize India not just like as one unit, but like a construction of like three or four possible units, right? Which we call as India one, two, three. And uh, how we look at it really, and like I also try and put it in perspective of like if we have any global examples, right? So India one, for example. Uh, so India overall, roughly 1.5 billion people and an economy of roughly 3.5 trillion dollars, right? If you break it down, India one is where we think like most paying consumers exist, right? People who transact regularly and who sort of like interact a lot with the startup ecosystem. So if you, I mean, the global parallel is someone like a Mexico, for example, right? So roughly, I would say 120 million million people that are in India one, hence 30 million households. And uh, the average per capita income of this Mexico that we have inside India is roughly $12,000, right? And that's where like most of the startups operate right now. So that's one part, like roughly $1.4 trillion of GDP. And also inside this India, one is like a even smaller constituency that we call India 1A, right? Where like e easy to understand is where a lot of D2C brands operate, for example, or someone like a Cred2, like how they started out, right? Like India 1A. Then comes India 2, Think of it as the Philippines, roughly 100 million people, uh, an average income of $3,000 or so. So that's roughly $300 billion in GDP. And we also see quite a few startups operating here and many who also started up with India 2 and then tried to move over to India 1 because like that's where the real money lies. Uh, someone like a me show, someone like a share chat, right? So who primarily operated in India 2 or like at least started out with it. Someone like Cuckoo FM, right? Or a stage as well. And then are like either have taken the decision to also include India 1 into their consumer base or are just like still still utilizing or still really expanding into India 2, right? And then you've got India 3, which is roughly 1.2 billion people, average income of $1.5,000 or so. So that's roughly $1.8 trillion of GDP, right? Massive GDP, but like the paying power is very, very small. And like we, we see very, very few startups that operate here, right? And even if we do, like if there's someone, if, if, if it's a consumer startup, right? Like consumer social startup, they rarely make any money here, right? So again, someone like a share chat or someone like a, someone like a Josh. There are few who have figured how to make money, but their growth has been slow, like a Kaleidophen and all. So that's how we try to look at India as like a breakup of India 1, 2, 3, right? And it's a philosophy or like an understanding that we also follow in Bloom on a wider basis because then it really helps us get into the depths of like how all these startups are solving particular problems. Right. In terms of the India 1, 2, and 3, right? I mean, do you see startups gaining in India 2 and India 3? How is that trend like basically? We, we see them gaining for sure because I mean, we have more and more adventurous and visionary founders who want to now build products for India 2 and India 3 and there have been for some time. I think what's really helped uh, in the recent years is for example something like a geo coming in or something like I mean the effects of COVID which sort of like percolated into the Indian economy right. So you've, you've got more wider adoption for sure from India 2 and India 3 for these startups but again what's been really tough so far is monetization right. I mean me show how it started out for India too. I mean, they've they've got like a, a lot of orders, but it's been difficult for them to make money, right? Similarly, I think like even someone like a share chat or someone like a Josh talks, for example, right? A lot of eyeballs or users that they get from India 2 and India 3, but it's been very difficult for them to convert them into consumers, right? Like people who actually pay for those sort of apps, right? If if a share chat is, has been dependent so far more on ads, then it's been difficult for them to also get like 
add revenues from that section of people, right? Yeah. So the adoption's wider, yes, but from a monetization perspective, it's still been like a very tough problem to solve so far. Right, Sajid, you've been patiently listening to this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think you know Amal put it very well. Structurally, we set up in India one, two, and three. But what are some of these key trends that are happening that is kind of impacting startups right now? Amal referred to the rise of Jio, and uh, now it's been six years since that spectacular rise, which sort of pulled, I would say, about two hundred to two fifty million Indians into the digital stream. They were not consumers even. They were not even users. But today, those 200 to 50 million have started using the internet, whether it's YouTube, WhatsApp, UPI. So all of that came through the, I would say, the low bandwidth costs which Geo helped kind of engender. That is one. Then, of course, Amal also referred to COVID as a forcing function for getting people along. There was Demon, for instance. So these are three steroid shots, you could say, which kind of spurred the rise of India 2 and the number of people, even from India 3, into using the internet. But I would say, if you look at startups, startups do operate in a slightly narrower spectrum of India. I would say key factors would be, for example, rising discretionary spends. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the consumption comes from uh, for startups from India 1, who historically have had greater discretionary spends. As India 2 kind of grows, it's, it is growing. Per capita income is still $3,000, much lower than India 1. But as, as their incomes rise, at least the top 10-15% of India 2, their incomes rise, they start becoming more digital consumers. So that helps startups. I would say the rise of formalization India stack and when you look at India stack, we of course know Aadhaar, we of course know UPI, but there is also OKEN or OCEN, which is Open Credit Enablement Network. There's ONDC, Open Network for Digital Commerce. Alphabet soup right now, but so I won't go too deep into it. But these are like, I would say, powerful enablers for uh, driving the next wave of digital products out of India. And I would say startups will take the lead there. Then there is this whole China plus one factor that's emerged, which is really geopolitics making their way. And that is leading to us, I mean, I wouldn't say uh, that Indian manufacturing has been non-existent. We have slowly been seeing it grow, but it's always been in the periphery. Yeah. But today, I would say it's become a little more mainstream because manufacturing, for example, is 17% of India's GDP. 30, 40 years back, it used to be you know, barely 10%. So the rise of manufacturing, the steady rise of manufacturing is emergence today. And thanks to the China plus one factor is also helping a lot of startups in the exports as well as in the manufacturing sphere like Zetwork, uh, able to kind of grow its business more rapidly. So these are really some, I would say, structural internal forces. Mm -hmm. Now there is one powerful external force, which is capital flows. And if you look at uh, capital flows, there we do have the nature of the U.S. Uh, economy to thank, the need for them to keep paying pensions, the need for them to find more attractive income streams, lead to them allocating more to tech and venture because they have been the biggest uh, returners. So the whole rise of alternative investments or alt investments, that's called venture forms a very powerful part of that. And India, of course, has been one of the faster growing ones. So yeah. there is an allocation towards India. So... Uh, some of which we'll have to see how it evolves as interest rates have gone up. But the last, uh, I would say like, you know, barring the last year, 13, 14 to around 2022, have been marked by super low interest rates and a lot of money coming into India. So we benefited from that. So these, I would say, are all the structural as well as uh, trends that have sort of kind of uh, impacted startups. I can double click into more of this if you wish. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, we'll uh, definitely deep dive into some of these. Um, just a quick comment on what you said, right? I mean, so we do something called a startup operator roundup on the weekends mm -hmm. where we talk about all of the activity from the Indian startup ecosystem over the week. And when we started out, we used to pretty much cover fundraisers and so on. Uh, what we realized, especially over the last six to nine months is such an overlap with industrial policy as well, right? I mean, whether it's the PLI, whether it's the fame subsidies or uh, even simple stuff like a redressal portal for, uh, you know, social media platforms and, and so on and so forth, uh, which are all, you know, impacting uh, startups in a pretty big way, I would say, right? If not, at least in a very minimal way how to begin with. So, yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic time in that sense. I want to pick up on something Sajid said, which is the whole formalization of the economy, right? Through identity layers like Aadhaar and uh, 
payments like UPI data, which he spoke about OCEN and so on, right? It's an amazing development for us, right? Earlier, I think, you know, when people asked you to formalize, I mean, the, there wasn't really an incentive, uh, you know, I mean, it just meant that the tax officials would, uh, you know, come barking up your uh, spine, right? I mean, but now uh, there's a real incentive for, uh, you know, businesses to formalize, uh, you know, whether it is access to credit or access to services, access to tech and so on and so forth. Could you talk about how much of an impact this whole formalization of uh, the economy has had on startups uh, per se? So I think the impact of formalization or like even the very efforts that have gone into it, right? Like we could really put it into perspective when we looked at multiple examples of like around this formalization bit, right? So and j we'll just like talk about a few examples here. If you look at formalization from the lens of taxes, right? Whether it's indirect or direct taxes, both of them. If you look at direct taxes, I think the number of income tax filers has gone up from like 40 million to 60 million in, in like four or five years, right? Even if you look at indirect taxes like GST, right? The number of firms which are filing GST was, I think six million, six years ago, and it's like 14 million now, right? And out of these 14 million, uh, roughly 12 and a half million of them are like smaller businesses, right? Which have mostly come on board in the last few years as they've understood the benefits of GST. I mean, now they can operate in more states and they were like, then just like the, just their home state because uh, they don't have to pay state level taxes as much anymore, right? Or the logistical overheads are lesser. So I think it's just like, it, it's really help like them understanding the benefits of GST, which has helped them come into the base and like really helped them formalize as well, right? Another angle to look at it would be via the lens of like social security. Like you've got various schemes, which has really helped people from even unorganized sectors come into the formalized economy. So the Atul Pension Yojana scheme uh, had half a million beneficiaries a few years ago and the beneficiary are up to 50 million now. So I think that's also really helped. And I think like the examples of formalization are like really widespread, right? If you look at other India stack examples or like India policy examples, account aggregator, for example, it hit like 4 million use cases or like 4, 4 million users like recently, right? Uh, so that's really helping ease credit for like all these businesses and like even on a personal level, even if you look at the household manufacturing sector, right? Just the percentage of salaries as, as like salaries as a percentage of overall GDP in household manufacturing sector has gone down again, right? It's decreased by around 20% in the last four or five years or so. So I think various examples we've seen in like the overall economy, which are really pointing towards the fact that the formalization levels are increasing. How that re how that's really helped is that either like also on a government level, transfer more benefits directly to the people, right? Or like even for the startups, basically them really understanding how big their customer base is, whether it's MSMEs, whether it's individuals, and then like target them accordingly, right? Like strategize accordingly, think like what exactly they can do and like how much they can monetize and everything, right? So I think that's been the real benefit of formalization here. Right. So Sajid, I mean, all of this can make one really optimistic. And I think, you know, being in VC and startups, I mean, we're all generally tend to be optimistic, I suppose, right? But you have this, you know, keeping it real slide, I'd like to call it, right? Which is slide 36, where you talk about, you know, previous uh, covers in Fortune and uh, uh, cover pages in Business Week, Economist and so on, right? Where there are these similar predictions that, you know, this is India's movement, India opens for business, rise of India, India's going to outpace China and so on <laughs> and so forth, right? True. <laughs> so we've heard it all before, but somehow, some way, I mean, this time seems different. And um, Why is it different? Do you think this is India's movement? Uh, what are some things that we should guard against? Well, um, you never know how geopolitics and tech trends and uh, many other factors play out. But I do uh, think this is a unique moment in India's history and context because a set of forces are aligning and it's not all internal to India. After a long, long era of, I would say, globalization, open borders, we are seeing uh, slowly walls coming up and geopolitical forces, including the Cold War that's emerging between China, uh, to an extent Russia on one side, and the West, uh, and their desire to pull India into its orbit means that sort of French shoring uh, is a very powerful trend influencing India's growth in exports, even though the last quarter hasn't been exactly uh, the way it should be, or even the rise of manufacturing, etc. So I would say that is one powerful factor, okay? 
second is the policies that have emerged uh, over the last i would say decade but accentuated over the last 6 7 years uh, which is an amal referred to it uh, he shared stats which kind of uh, show how the economy has been moving in the direction of greater formalization uh, so that matters as well because what it means is it now makes people more complicit in the development of india in in for example you know like you rightly said earlier the incentive to be part of the formalized economy was only that you would get hit for taxes but now we have people the defined benefit transfer it's huge those numbers so people want aadhar people want an identity you know that's one so let's see this 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 is india stack led kind of digitalization that's happened look at upi for example the stats are mind boggling i won't go deeper into it so so allied to i would say geopolitics the china plus one uh, friend shoring then second is the digital stack essentially our public digital goods and we have a very evolved public digital good on par if not better than many countries in the west two the physical infra as well uh, the public digital goods are digital they can't be seen but even the physical infra when you look at the road construction for example that's been at a super pace all of that is going to kind of impact in uh, i would say the friction reduction so both public digital goods gst paying fast track then the infrastructure the highway all of that is going to mean that the friction that historically that existed which is why logistics for example is as much as 13 or 14% of the indian gdp is very high compared to the us that will go down third is you mentioned fame you mentioned pli again i won't go deeper into it but for the first time there is a muscular i would say industrial policy okay manufacturing and industrial policy and a desire to improve it certain things of course need to improve like our industry is heavily overweighted towards higher end skills and not as labor rich as for example like a bangladeshi or a vietnamese economy is so certainly some things need to change but the direction is right so i would say the coming together of all of these allied to a very vibrant startup ecosystem and in india the startup ecosystem punches well above its weight yeah. right it's a non insignificant part of the indian economy so all of this are why i would say that it is india's movement and it is not uh, misplaced to say that the three slides that i said was more to set the context that we've been here before there have been some false starts and look it happens and uh, but this time i think it's for the real yeah yeah one of the things that you know really surprised me was your comparison of mutual fund inflows versus uh, vc capital right and i wouldn't i mean even being in the indian startup i wouldn't have really guessed that the vc funds had uh, outstripped the mutual fund inflows in 21 you know even given the record inflows and everything it seemed uh, like i mean i wouldn't have even considered that given you know what has happened uh, with rising interest rates and 2022 was uh, you know sort of a pale shadow compared to 2021 the funding dropped from 40 billion dollars to around 25 billion dollars or so where are we in 2023 you know because if you look at the global vc funding we're still a tiny uh, percentage of that right uh, for what uh, is the second or third largest uh, indian uh, startup ecosystem in the world where are we at this point of time yeah we're about 5% of global gdp Uh, sorry we are 5% of the global vc funding i would say 2023 has been a lot muted uh, we only put 3 months into it but uh, roughly we are tracking uh, at if you look at the vc deployment arr so to say that would be about 12 to 13 billion we're doing about a billion a month certainly less than what we're doing last year but overall it is in line with uh, i would say what is happening globally as well so nothing too far off i would say that and a lot of the uh, developments over the last couple of days uh, certainly mean that it's hard to predict because you don't know how the market will evolve will we go into a deep freeze funk for a few months don't know so i would say that 2023 is likely to be more cautious keeping in mind what's happened with svb in the last couple of days even otherwise the larger malaise that has been in i would like to kind of just double click into one aspect i would say that i think a lot more of the malaise has and the slowdown has been on the growth side of you see like the growth is a really bigger se- segment of indian venture seed as such is barely 10% of the market like for example if you look at last year it was a 24 25 billion dollar vc deployment market and growth was 16 billion 
two thirds of it seat was not even 10% barely 10% i would say this is really one factor to keep in mind and growth ain't going to come back i feel in a hurry so uh, i do feel that if you were to ask me to double click i would say that i'm always optimistic you have to be optimistic uh, you have to bet on uh, the ingenuity of the indian entrepreneur uh, and fortunate that we are on the seed side so uh, but i would say that uh, i would be cautiously optimistic uh, and i would say i would put the emphasis on the word cautious a little bit more than the <laughs> than the word optimist but yeah uh, i hope i've been able to kind of explain that to you yeah i think you put it well uh, everyone is in this sort of a wait and watch mode right i mean there's just so much of ambiguity right now with the macro situation especially um but i do also believe that given that you know 15 20 of the vc funds have raised uh, new funds themselves including bloom as well congratulations on that thank you uh, right so it's just a matter of time when this capital has to be deployed i mean it definitely has to be deployed within the next 2 3 years so it's uh, you know we'll wait and watch when the dam sort of ba- breaks loose and this money comes into the market you know when i compare the indian entrepreneurs of today right with you know folks who came in maybe 10 15 20 years back i mean i personally feel having seen these uh, folks for you know first hand these guys are a lot more resilient a lot more innovative of course i mean there are the excesses and what not uh, for sure you know you know we can hark back to those days and say that you know people were a lot more conservative that uh, you know a dollar went a longer way and all of those things uh, but there's no taking away from the fact that you know these folks are a lot more smarter right uh, of course building on all of the predecessors and so on right i mean you obviously i mean you talk to you know dozens of entrepreneurs on a everyday basis right what do you noticed that is unique with the indian entrepreneurs today oh you said it well there has been an evolution in the indian entrepreneur i dare say the indian startup entrepreneur especially if you look at uh, the in the indian startup ecosystem and we can sort of look at it as a series of waves right if you look at the evolution of the indian startup ecosystem i would say uh, very early on we started with uh, really service led startups like mastic and kale consultants these were all uh, venture funded initially even uh, mindtree uh, those entrepreneurs were not very different from their peers in the industrial economy right whether it's an infosys or whatever they're not very different but gradually with the rise of naukri redbus the indian startup entrepreneur emerged very conservative as you said because the indian venture ecosystem was not very large there was still an emphasis on unit economics cash flow which is never wrong but given the capital starved nature given that there were not too many operators they had to be uniquely focused on profitability I much more best example here i mean uh, that i often cite is that the hottest indian startup mm-hmm. in 2012 or 13 i'm not sure which is redbus sold for about 120 million true true it was a very uh, i would say uh, unevolved is not the right word but it was a nascent market yeah okay. exactly no it's something that you know you wouldn't even conceive of today absolutely absolutely you can't imagine all of that value being created absolutely today it would be nothing less than a billion right full credit to the founders of that oh, era of as the era evolved came the bunsels and uh, all of the different bunsels uh, but the flipkart bunsels uh, take full credit uh, for really pushing the uh, indian startup entrepreneur a uh, forward as a kind of a uh, you know hero symbol and i would say there you saw the first time the bold fearless entrepreneur was not afraid to take risks not worried about profitability and the indian startup ecosystem also began to see the rise of the indian venture kind of ecosystem tigers of the world came in you know and foreign guys came in so all of that helped and so sort of bolder bigger better of course uh, you know and over the last 2 to 3 years i would say a few things have happened one we have the second time founder coming back like you know mukesh pansal is a good example there are many more or Sachin even the pansal. operators also uh, the senior operators well leadership folks well, well put well put i was just going to come to that that as much as the founders there are only certain number of founders but there are a lot more operators and what we're really seeing is uh, for example sujith of udan is a great example he was not a founder of flipkart right but he was a super operator so they are coming in and they are starting up or even for example there's this classic iit bits then two years in some consulting firm uh, 
uh, Bain, BCG, Mech, and then uh, two, three years in one of the hot uh, unicorns, unicorns like a Misho or Urban Co as some kind of a product manager starting up. So they're not exactly very uh, elite operators yet. They're young, but they're energetic, they're vibrant, they've seen growth, and they're able to kind of, I would think of them as fluent or semi-fluent founders, right? They're fluent with the ways of the trade. And what you're really seeing is folks who are able to look at what's happening in the internet. They read all the usual stuff. They read Paul Graham. They've learned YC Startup School. And they're also learning from, you know, blogs and posts and communities like SaaS Boomi, D2C Insider. And what we're really seeing is thus a very bold, well-versed with, with how a startup growth model works, fluent in how venture works, kind of founder emerge. And uh, that is really, I would say, a clear distinction between the founders of that era and this. They are, these guys are more clued they, uh, and they're able to take bigger, aggressive bets. And this is something I've spoken to many VCs abroad as well. They don't see much of a difference between the elite Indian founder and the elite founder in the valley. There's absolutely no difference. They're on par. As you go down the percentiles, there might be some change. And uh, this is how the Indian entrepreneur, startup entrepreneurs evolved. Also, just adding something, I think it's been implicit in the answer so far, but especially calling it out. I think it's also on a softer angle, it's also been the mentorship that new age founders are getting from the folks who started back up in 2015, 16, yeah. right? Who are either angels in the startups or who just like guiding them throughout it because these people have been through that turbulent phase then. And if uh, and like for all the founders who are going through this turbulent growth phase right now, I think it, that, that sort of mentorship, that angle really helps them. I couldn't agree more. I think it's the sign of a maturing ecosystem when people kind of come together, right? I mean, there is a greater sense of community, I would say. There's a greater sort of an institutional knowledge today. And, you know, I remember, you know, 10 years back, I mean, you had to sort of look to the West, uh, you know, in terms of very operational uh, stuff that you wanted to do, right? I mean, whether it's hiring an engineering leader or figuring out how to scale your, uh, you know, operations or whatever it is. But today there are Indian playbooks for many of these things, right? And that's amazing. Uh, so that coupled with the with the fact that these guys are just absolutely unafraid to fail, right? The downside risks have uh, really gone down over the years, which is a very, very good thing. It's a huge net positive, I would say, right? One of the things that, you know, also piqued my interest in the um, slide deck, right, in the report is that whole aggregated manufacturing space that you talk about, right? And I, I kind of put it as verticalized marketplaces. You know, if you were to think of uh, the marketplaces today, they're not just marketplaces in the classical sense of the term where they're bringing demand and supply together. They're also layering software, they're layering services, they're la layering financing in, in a lot of uh, places, right? And uh, the examples you talk about are Zetwork and Fashionza. Could you talk about, you know, how that is sort of building new ecosystems and changing the game? Right. So I'll talk about like what someone like a Zetwork or a Fashionza is doing. And then I'll also like probably talk about the broader scale implications of it. Uh, if you look at it, right. So if you just consider the overall manufacturing setup in India, right? You've got more than 200K factories, right? More than 90% of them have less than 500 employees, right? And like a lot of them even have less than 30 employees. So like most of these are small scale factories. The challenges which these factories struggle with are like, I mean, they don't get as much orders to fulfill, right? So a lot of their capacity goes almost like wasted, doesn't really live up to the potential that they can produce. What someone like a Zetwork did, for example, like they started out, of course, with getting just like getting them orders in out, right? Help them improve their capacity and their output. But the real angle of innovation was getting like a huge order from someone, right? Like if they wanted, for example, 10 units of something produced, they not just like give all those 10 orders to one MSME to sort of like manufacture and then give it back. Instead, they came up with this idea of parallel manufacturing, right? Where they would distribute that order within like perhaps maybe 10 factories, right? Or five factories, two to units each. What it really helped them do was one, really reduce the risk of like delay of timelines, right? Even if one of those units is now faltering instead of like, instead of all the five, at least they could get out 10 units for the order, right? And like that reduced timeline delay, they could take better control of risk of quality as well, right? They could understand the whole bit around like, I mean, and they really use the tech to their advantage in terms of like how to outsource all of this and everything. So I think there was, there was really great from, from like a innovative angle. And the larger story that really tells is that now in India, you've not just got founders who are 
just building startups which are copycats of something that was built in the global audience mm-hmm. but like people are coming up with their own original ideas right yeah. and i think that's been the real implication and it all ties back to like what we've been talking about in terms of the new age entrepreneur being like more fearless they being they are becoming more creative in terms of the ideas they come up with the problem statements they want to tackle and i think this is like a great example of it and uh, i think like also the vertical marketplace thing that you refer to right i think absolutely true it's not just like really matching demand and supply zwork originally started out with them just like selling their software but then they realized that like they could use their software much better than their customers could because of like all the organizational complexities and all that exist in the customers right so instead they use the software to their advantage and really provide like a full stack service to a, all of their customers right so it's not just giving them orders but it's everything from designing to procurement of raw materials to uh, sending them out uh, sending the order out to them right including quality checks and everything financing too right so i think i think it's really that sort of like a like a innovative approach to the business model as well as the ideas that's really uh, sort of come out in this manufacturing space right which which has been really exciting and the level of support that's gone out to this angle roughly 900 million dollars or so of funding have has gone into this space in the last few years right so that that that's immense and especially considering where india was from like a manufacturing sort of like purview and i think it's really helped also put these startups and india's manufacturing also onto the global map yeah i think uh, what will be interesting is if they start aggregating some of the demand overseas right yeah and then funneling that uh, to the indian manufacturing sector i mean that would be amazing right i mean Next we can uh, streamline everything and and i think indian manufacturing in general i think they're waiting for that you know foxconn plant to come up perhaps another you know like a tsmc or something else right i mean so that we can also like build that uh, knowledge base and that institutional knowledge right in order for us to you know be able to produce some of this stuff right i mean we don't have that three or four decade uh, leap that uh, china has right ahead of us uh, so stuff like this will really help you know when we talk about the the number of employees that startups have right i mean the numbers i've seen numbers range from 2 lakh to 6 lakh etc yeah. but what makes it a lot more impactful is the second third order impact of of these right because how you define these workers itself might vary uh, because those folks on the zwork platform may not necessarily constitute zwork's employees but you know you could definitely consider themselves a uh, uh, pl- partners for instance or you know however you want to put it right consultants partners uh, so on and so forth uh, similarly this whole gig economy as such right mm-hmm. where people can log on log off uh, a- an app uh, and work uh, part time full time as per their sort of needs right so how has you know tech and startups created this new class of workers in your opinion right i'll try and break down the question i think like one when you say new class of workers you've got white collar uh, jobs and you also got gig jobs right and then also what's been the impact of like creation of these jobs right i think starting with the first part again going into some numbers here so uh, you've got i think like if you look at india's overall job sector they've got roughly i think 35 million white collar jobs in india right now right what really happens is like each direct job that's created in the startup ecosystem it also helps create three roughly three jobs or so in the overall wider ecosystem right uh, so someone in the finance space for example or someone in the admin space someone in the creative space right so uh, directly indirectly startups have now been responsible for roughly 3.5 million jobs wide collar jobs which which have been created right it's roughly 10% of the overall job sector that's that's i think like a huge impact like i mean considering the number of years that startups have been in existence right or like even the overall size of it versus like overall uh, like india's macro economic size right so i think that's huge impact secondly more especially i think gig workers uh, i think right now india's got like upwards of 4 million sort of like platform led gig workers right when i mean platform we mean like workers who uh like our partners of someone like a swiggy or an open company or an uber right so again like roughly 4 million people who have now become like a part of as we call this like formalized economy right again 4 million is like again a huge number right so i think just this impact is something that like i mean personally i especially love when it comes to like what we can do with the venture in the startup ecosystem the i th- i think that's also been like uh, i think in my mind the magnitude of impact really so yeah that's how i look at it fantastic yeah it's 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 actually very fascinating you know the the true impact of startups uh, even on the labor force right i mean something that 
maybe i mean there needs to be an academic uh, study of that you know in terms of how far it really goes right yeah. sajit last year or the year before uh, indian startups learned about this quarter se quarter tak mentality <laughs> right there are a yeah. bunch of these folks listed on the public markets and then had a battering uh, right and uh, that obviously has uh, spooked a bunch of uh, other startups as well and they're kind of like playing it safe at this point of time and in the report you talk about the ogs right you talk about the regulatory rajas uh, you talk about the consumer compounders and the big wigs and what startups can learn from all of these folks to truly build a large and sustainable business in india i i, I found that really fascinating could you like talk a little bit about that no absolutely uh, what we did was uh, looked at all of the big wealth creators and we just said let's look at all of the people who are about 200000 crores in market cap and which is about 25 billion dollars and when we looked at it we div- we saw that they fell very neatly into three buckets and of course uh, the names we you know indulged our creativity very creative names yeah you no know, thank you for that clearly you know about the infosys of the world which really are built in india for the globe and you know about the hdfcs and the asian paints which are really a, like a bet on the indian consumers rising power but it was very interesting to kind of look at for example uh, uh, reliance which is really the paramount example the canonical example but there's also adani so lnt which have the ability to kind of understand what is needed by the indian government in terms of infrastructure creation then take those risks much like indian startup founders take those risks take those risks some of those policies are still evolving and some of the payouts because uh, a lot of them are state supported and all the state has to for example support in other ways like land for example but they are able to take those risks they understand how the government works and use the power that they have with the government and of course it's a slight faustian bargain in that sense and they are able to kind of do what is not easily done so india has always lacked a little bit for state capacity but we can actually see the muscle developing whether it's covid 2 billion doses done whether it's defined benefit transfer muscle that we are able to kind of flex or even for example like the highway construction uh, pace that we are able to do and now for example the capacity that the private sector is showing in terms of uh, infrastructure creation whether it is the mundra port or the jamnagar refinery or etc right as well. yeah. yeah defense as well uh, so these are all examples uh, of of capacity uh, muscle being developed so that's that's really what i felt so what could startups learn it is tough for startups to operate in the regulatory raja field i mean I know, maybe they can do a b2b or a saas for some of that but really on the consumer compounders um, i think the big learning and you spoke about the quarter to quarter tak and the battering that they have received i think one interesting learning and uh, this is uh, from looking at we actually looked at some of the most successful ones and one uh, insight and it was well expressed by irena vettel that the best indian consumer compounders have always paid heed to market the market fo- the nature of the indian market which is that it is not a ma- yeah it's 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 a it's a smaller consumption market than uh, like typically you expect a lot of purchasing power is held in the top the power law as we call it and they pay a lot of heed to unit economics and they ensure that the growth is in line with the growth in purchasing power of the indian consumer they never grow ahead of the market mm-hmm. and i think a lot of the indian startups have not exactly paid heed to this perhaps on the back of the rich reserves that they kind of accumulated thanks to funding they have invested from my side i feel sometimes it's over invested in the indian market because the purchasing power is a little more sh- smaller than the kind of money that they're putting in so so that point of view i think the big learning has been to kind of grow with the market and that was a big learning for me from looked at uh, you know the consumer compounders part especially yeah right i think the defense is uh, a developing sector right i mean i if you look at some of these drone startups we've had a few of them on the podcast as well idea forge r a one man systems and the likes right i mean these guys proper deep tech guys uh, are getting uh, government of india contracts right and uh, a lot of the cases you know these are iit props who are directly mentoring working with these folks as well and you know the stuff that they're producing is truly world class so yeah i mean uh, 
that that could be interesting uh, the way it uh, pans out in the future you know when we talk about india one india two india three one of the things that truly has you know uh, left me dumbfounded at least was the rise of this whole subscription economy right uh, which is and, and especially in sectors that you know are what are deemed non essential right completely discretionary whether it is uh, you know media entertainment and so on not even a tech right and here you have a bunch of these folks right kuku fm uh, pratilipi stage some of the gaming uh, startups as well who have managed to get the 5 rupee 10 rupee 50 rupee 100 rupee sashay kind of purchases from this india to india 3 demographic that we talk about right, right. yeah you, you want to talk about that uh, amal yeah i'd like to think that like those business models which are more oriented towards subscription i think they've been born out of constraints pretty much when you look at like how unsatisfying ad revenues have been so far right so i think we we also put this tweet out in the report like where india can be looked at as like a down mouth farm right and like the canonical example someone like a daily hunt right 114 115 million dows and their arr is 175 million dollars right so that's like roughly 1.5 dollars per consumer uh, if you compare that with the snapchat it's like roughly 1/8th 1/9th of like what we see out in the west right so those are i think like almost like unsustainable from a unit economics perspective and as a result what we've seen is like a new wave of these startups who are not really reliant on ad revenues as much and then instead going the subscription view where again the bet that they've taken is that if they provide good content people will on like a continuous basis and like not just ads from companies but like actual consumers will pay for this content right as you said koku fm i think great example i think upwards of 2.5 million subscri- subscribers now up stage right like it's growing like, extremely well 225k plus subscribers now so i think good developments there and uh, and like also the example that you referred right i think like gaming players especially have also really tapped into this behavior i think like, in my mind what really helps them on a consumer psychology level is that people typically like being right they want to be proven right so which is why i mean someone like a dream 11 or someone even like a like like those rummy games that you have right like or those poker games that you have i think uh the number of paying users in gaming is as upwards of 100 million right that that's absolutely huge like it's i mean it's just like second to e-commerce uh, on like a paying consumer level also i like another great example is share chat right i think like a year ago fi21 or so out of the 80 cr or so of the revenue that they had most of it was coming from ads and roughly around 3 3 and a half cr was something that they've the feature the feature that they have around virtual gifting in like chat rooms and everything right their revenue grew to 350 cr this year and that 3 cr of gifting or like gaming revenue right that grew up to 120 cr almost wow. it's it's a third of their revenues now so i think like startups have tapped well into that behavior so overall i think the story is just that they're relying less and less on ad revenues and they're growing or like finding out other ways of monetizing this consumer base right just like as as we referred to earlier like converting these users into consumers perhaps ads is not the best way perhaps like subscription or gamification or like just gaming is 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 perhaps a better way and a more innovative way no i think the money is definitely there right so i always used to disagree with the fact that india 2 india 3 doesn't pay as much mm-hmm. i think we haven't really figured out the value right uh, like how to get them to pay. how to get them to pay exactly because i mean if you look at weddings for example right i mean they're as big if not bigger uh, in rural india or outside of the cities and metros than you would find within right so so i think it's about innovative business models it's about uh, true proper value creation aligned to you know what they would want i suppose right and and yeah we're yet to see the the full picture on that front i I'd think i'd love to kind of come in here and uh, we talk about dream 11 and we spoke about innovative models i remember this uh, conversation that uh, harsh jain had uh, with uh, some of our founders and we were listening in and he spoke about how you have to rethink the pricing and uh, not just the pricing rethink the business model and uh, so he said if the challenge with india too is not that they can't spend as much as you do but the way they spent is a little different so is famous scaven care inspired sachet that you have in consumer products uh, you need to kind of think about pricing in that context so he spoke about how if you are charging 1000 rupees in let's say india 1 you can't charge 1000 rupees per month in india 2 perhaps you need to lower it a little bit but uh, even if you're not lowering it you c- should split it into different packets like 20 rupees a day or 30 rupees a day and then for 30 days the india 2 user has the ability to pay lower amounts more frequently 
and that is how you sort of evolve the model so you can't take what works in india one because they have a lot more ability to buy full packs mm-hmm. or uh, pay in advance whereas the india to user is always simply cash starved so they want to see sashi pricing so this is one way in which i think the startups that cater to india too have thought about it and i think they've realized that micro payments uh, uh, have have the ability to kind of lure more india to users in so which is why a lot of the payments like stage is a great example netflix is what uh, lowest in the world they say india is around 500 600 rupees per month stage is 400 rupees a year mm-hmm. so that is a way you kind of think about uh, pricing also this micro sashi is not just like visible in consumer apps but also something like in fintech right jars again i think a great example of where we've seen this like where their model really revolves around this micro sashi ticket sizes that they get out to consumers right really helping them expand their consumer base as well yeah i think there needs to be innovation on pricing as well as value both right i mean to really attack that market one of the things uh, uh, for very obvious reasons that i'm very optimistic about is saas right yeah. i work in saas and i and i do believe it's the moment of reckoning for uh, us Uh, in that uh, i've often made this point on the podcast that you know for three or four decades we've been building all sorts of software uh, in the back end right whether it is you know supply chain accounting uh, whatever else kind of uh, software and i think over the last 15 years we've kind of figured out how to productize it and i think we are in the throes of figuring out how to really sell it to the world right A- and here again on the saas front you talk about the big phenomena which is build in india sell globally and then you have the sastra or the bharat saas phenomena where which is like building software for indian businesses something that again i never thought that i would hear <laughs> <because> <laughs> <laughs> there were few things as challenging as selling software or any intangible service to uh, an indian business but but yeah i mean people are building that right i mean uh, true uh, so on the saas front uh, sajit what do you think is happening yeah saas has uh, really been a big success story for india and historically saas or what we think of now as saas was really born in chennai uh, in i would say the early 2000s or to mid 2000 through zoho then freshworks in the early part of last decade to whether it's kiss flow or charge b etc so they pioneered this model uh, that we know of as uh, using content led inbound motion supported by inside sales served out of india and built a phenomenal franchise that is really saas as we know it there are variants there for there is now an enterprise motion uh, because these names that i mentioned earlier they all historically started with and largely serve smbs some of them have moved into enterprises naturally right and but there are a lot of indian startups druva for example which is enterprise focused then there is the postmans and the lambda tests of the world with their uh, plg motion okay so what we are seeing is in the big motion now a big itself is moved from a single motion to what three motions then we have opposite of the big which is really not the opposite but the build in india for india so vimo is a great example of that and uh, where you work and uh, now you started with india and now you're looking more but uh, many indian startups have not been as successful as vimo is in 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 pricing open the indian market yeah. tally is an example of uh, like 90% piracy i believe at one stage and if you look at for example the khata books of the world they've not really been able to sell to indian smbs so i think they've evolved a model uh, whereby they give saas at very throwaway prices or virtually or free and try and monetize through something else two examples we could look at khata book is an example of giving saas virtually free and seeing if we can monetize through fintech lending because you get a lot of data etc uh, class plus in our portfolio has looked at it through marketplaces sell saas not free uh, they do price but it's not very expensive it's affordable um, like 12000 rupees etc but they take a small cut of the marketplace that they enable so this is what we call saas tra which is saas plus transaction is one way to kind of survive in uh, through saas in india if the customer is not paying the full price a related variant is what ship rocket and zetwork practice where they started with saas but then realized that and amal mentioned it earlier that like zetwork's genius was that they recognized that they are the best users of their software and uh, they realized that rather than focus on saas or even saas tra they said just focus on the tra part of it 
you know just just give the saas virtually free away or just just drop the saas transactions and that's a powerful thing as well okay because in india i think somehow we hate paying for products we love paying for services we see the person etc so so that's work it's interesting that over the last uh, uh, few years saas revenues in india have doubled it used to be we look at saas arr it used to be 5 6 billion in 2019 now it's about 12 13 and typically about 75% is big uh, is really uh, and uh, about 25% is domestic indian revenues and the domestic part of it has been growing the percentage has been growing so that is really i would say the parallel saas playbooks that have emerged and big for example started with one playbook but now has three playbooks and the sastra model itself has uh, emerged to kind of cater to the indian market and that has one variant which is just the tra model i would say so this is sort of the story of saas in india yeah yeah i think you know since you mentioned why more right i mean we kind of fit somewhere slightly adjacent to this because in the sense that we are born out of india we served india and then we moved to asia and then the us and if you polled our founders today i mean would we do that same journey i think no right i mean we would be born in the us perhaps uh, the other thing is the the fact that we were we serve large enterprises as well and post covid what we've realized is even a large enterprise high touch high engagement sale people are sort of receptive right now uh, people are questioning all of their you know sales forces uh, sap's oracle uh, deployments and really thinking about where, you know if there is something that can do the job uh, more efficiently uh, cheaper faster in in every way right and, and that kind of gives a scope for the vimo like solutions which are revisiting the conventional software in in that sense and really asking the roi question right so yeah and and you know bunch of uh, startups that i can think of who are doing something similar right icert as you mentioned druva for example um right and 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 i think the the acvs are only going to get larger uh, from what i've seen right i mean even the darwin boxes of the world they they perhaps started at a 1015k and then today they probably a 3040k uh, web engage is another example i think there are about 50k 50 50 60k right now at this point so yeah on on that front i think this there's, there's there's just so much of <laughs> yeah i'd love to double click into what you mentioned about the acv part and i think the indian entrepreneur uh, whether it's even freshworks even they started out catering to smbs and I've slowly got into the enterprises of the world right uh, slowly but steadily and i think this is one part we didn't double click but it's uh, actually it'd be love to kind of do a chart whereby if you could get the data to look at about 10 indian companies mm-hmm. in 2000 say 10 and or 12 and what were their a- uh, acvs and of course adjust it for uh, purchasing power etc and look at what the acvs are today and i would say it would be you're absolutely right there would be at least a 3 4 5 x difference oh yeah i mean uh, for sure so when i joined vimo in 2017 our uh, acvs were around 50k today we're approaching the half a million mark wow right and uh, you know i mean the us hasn't even matured for us japan mm-hmm. hasn't even matured for us right mm-hmm. we're still in the mm-hmm. one to n journey in these markets and so you can imagine you know how much more True. the growth could be potentially on the acv front right yeah so very interesting stuff and and when i see the entrepreneurs coming into saas as well right i mean these are folks who are not the you know typical right out of college garage startup types i mean these are folks who've spent you know 10 or 15 years in the industry they know the domain very well right and they found the you know like a technology partner or co-founder to sort of build out this uh, new vision just uh, double click into one part which is the saas corridor that exists and saas especially is the most evolved part of the startup ecosystem in india so sort of joke that saas is the physics of the venture ecosystem venture startup world because you know it is how it is right arr ac is very structured in many ways and one uh, they benefited from is uh, the bangalore bay area corridor which exists there are firms for example uh, like bloom itself has a partner in the bay area sanjay nexus for example is uh, bangalore and bay area like they they started out like that and almost all firms lightspeed has the many firms which have a strong presence this was a greater collaboration between us firms in the bay area yeah. which look at saas because yeah. many of them have indian uh, partners as well yeah. right and and so this is one big reason as well the learning is great and uh, sort of the playbook that has emerged now and we and there's a lot of collaboration between founders like hey how are you cracking your visa to who are you, who are you for example using for this law firm or how are you uh, giving salaries to this what who are you using so a lot of the tribal knowledge is is yeah. is, is getting shared correct and that's helping 
SaaS founders and the growth of SaaS as well. They call it the B two B model, the Bangalore to Bay model. Yeah. yeah, no, I think that especially in the B two B software SaaS space, right? I mean, uh, maybe hopefully we will see that on the B two C front at some point of time, maybe in next five ten years. But it's definitely on the B two B side of things, right? I mean, there's so much of a um, cross pollination of ideas. Uh, people have a precedence for you know how to hire how to set up these uh, functions and so on and so forth they are established standard playbooks now yeah all right last few questions before we wind up um oftentimes you know when i talk about vc and startups and so on right i mean i get this question which is when is vc money going to find its way into deep tech into science uh, startups uh, uh, and so on and so forth right but we are starting to see the early signs of that, right? I mean, you saw a bunch of these space startups, for example, raise a bunch of cash. You, drones, I mentioned. I haven't really heard too much on the the biology and the core science aspects of it, but I do feel that it's gravitating towards that, right? Uh, like we see in the Valley as well, right? I mean, a whole bunch of startups working on new tropics and all of that stuff. Yeah, so Sajid, any, uh, do you see like a tangible movement towards that? I do see, and uh, the next Indus Valley report should look at, take a closer look at deep tech for sure. And climate tech, we made a small beginning this time. And certainly feel that on all of the sectors that you mentioned, barring, say, biology, uh, we've seen a distinct movement in that direction. Uh, almost every VC fund has a stake in a space tech startup, like we have in Pixel, somebody else has in others, etc., so space tech, for example, had its year this year. That said, this is only the tip of the iceberg. We like to see more companies. Drone, for example, uh, slowly we'll start seeing more. Defense is one area they've started working together. Uh, and unlikely there will be any big consumer place, but there might be some interesting uh, stuff happening. For example, medical use, for example, all of that will happen. I would say biology is still some time away and perhaps uh, we'll start seeing some signs of that in the next year or year after that. There is certainly interest in the deep tech. Materials is one area where there's a lot more. Log9, for example, is another. Renewables and so on. Renewables, I would say, has been more of an infra play. And renewables, I haven't, maybe, I haven't looked specifically at deep tech into that. It's not an area that I look at within Bloom. But uh, deep tech is something we want to look at more deeply. I would say one of the challenges in deep tech, and I'll be honest about it, has been that Unlike in the traditional venture where the time taken for product is a certain finite thing, like SaaS, whatever software you want to build, end of the day you get five, six, seven, sometimes more engineers into a room and uh, give them the product uh, problem statement. They will come out two, three months later with an MVP that you can throw at the market, right? But deep tech is not like that, right? Uh, so uh, it needs patient capital. Venture is, I, I wouldn't say it's impatient capital, but it's not as patient as what deep tech needs. So historically, we've not had a flourishing relationship uh, between, I would say, for example, how the internet came in, in the US, right? The military uh, kind of the government kind of invested in it and that led to the private sector building on top of it. That hasn't happened in India yet. Uh, the second is Indian uh, larger corporates don't spend as much into R&D as they should. Uh, so all of this means that uh, the product side of it, you know, needs a lot more evolving development before it can be commercialized. And that has been one challenge. But it is getting sorted out, like with all things, slowly and steadily, uh, Indian uh, the startup ecosystem in chipping at it. We should see a lot more in the space, drone, material science spaces in the deep tech field in the next few years. Biology possibly will come late. I think even developments in biology will be more agri-led, like you've had Absolute, for example, right? I think like you'll see more R&D plays coming in from that direction. But otherwise, I think, as I did said, like we're still a few years away. I would love to see someone like a Colossal coming up in India as well, right? Like, I mean, just like reviving extinct animals. But I think we're, we're, we're still a few years away from that. I think Deep Tech right now is geared towards... Uh, solving very very crucial problems in India and that's where you'll see the first front of innovation coming in and others like we can just like wait and watch. No, I think the I, we have to figure a way to collapse those iteration cycles right I mean that is the key uh, and if you look at what's happened on the space front I think the few things that have made all the difference 
is uh, you know isro work, working very actively with the startups as well yeah. uh, through the indian space association and so on sharing their resources facilities and so on right and you know the rise of uh, 3d printing printing for example mm-hmm. right being able to print all of this high precision uh, instruments and uh, machines and so on so so i think that has made the difference maybe i mean we're looking at you know perhaps i mean in, even in other fields if there is an equivalent of that uh, i think we should see some more money coming in some more vc action for sure right yeah no absolutely and i think while you need to compress the iteration cycle i think it's in something like deep tech it's at least right now it seems like it's very difficult to do that because it, it, it is a lot of experimentation and just like getting those results back and everything right i think that's where collaboration with industry with like conventional players also makes it very very like pretty much necessary to the roots of deep tech and we're seeing that already so those are good signs but uh, but you're right i mean ideally you need to find a way to sort of like reduce those like all those cycles because it's not just the seed investors but it's also the growth investors right like i mean everyone like all of their capital which needs to come in to really help these deep tech players become bigger the conventional cycles don't really hold as well for them so it, it's got to change at some point slowly steadily but hopefully changes all right with that we come to the end of a rather long but very fascinating conversation folks i mean if you haven't checked out the indus valley report uh, it is on the bloom uh, website i think bloom.vc is the uh, uh, url we'll link to it in the uh, description on the platforms thank you sajid thank you amal uh, Thanks, for Roshan. being on the podcast this was an amazing conversation it was a pleasure thank you for having us roshan it was a pleasure thanks everyone and see you on another episode